That's the one. All right. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to tonight's meeting being held here in the town council chambers. The date is Tuesday, September 12th, 2017. And I want to remind you that at this meeting, it's being recorded and please turn off all cell phones. Ellie, can you please do the roll call? Thank you and good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Present. Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Mr. Forrest? Mr. Hill? Ms. Moon? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Here. Mrs. Basil? Present. Vice Chairperson Mr. Morris? Here. Chairperson Mrs. Granado? Present. And Weathersfield High School Representative, Student Representative, Mr. Justin, sorry. Eber. Bianchi. Bianchi, right? Present. Okay. All and present. Thank you. And I would like Justin who is our high school liaison to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Great, thanks Justin and welcome. Okay, Mr. Emmett, do we have a student or staff recognition tonight? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, show you a little video clip. Um, I received this clip yesterday from Ms. Takor of the action that goes on at Emerson Williams uh, Elementary School. And uh, it's about a four and a half minute clip. And uh, it has a superstar of a teacher and a superstar class. Um, you know, it's interesting as we're dealing with the uh, lack of a state budget, which I'll speak of a little bit later, um, the word perseverance um, is really something that we've had to uh, focus on. Um, so this particular clip is Miss Dawson's kindergarten class at Emerson Williams. It says to Mrs. Dawson's friends. Who's this for all friends? of us? Should we open it? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let me see. Yeah. All right, I'm going to start on this end. What are they? 
it. <laughs> there's a lot more in there. Look at. I think there's enough for all of you. No, I don't think so. But I want to talk to you first. I want to talk to you before so I give cool. you. That's so cool. I thought it was there was gonna it was gonna be an awesome setup to there was like. Can you sit for me for one minute? Yeah, okay. One, two, three. Crisscross. Hands in your lap. Lips are zipped. Ears are on. When I open my eyes, you're ready to listen and learn. One, two, three. I want to talk to you about something. What's that big P word we've been talking about this week? Persevere. Persevere. What does persevere mean? Never give up. Never give up. Did I give up when that no. got too hard? Mm -mm. No. Did I keep trying? Yeah. yeah. And was there something really cool inside the box? Yeah. Zayden, please stop. So boys and girls, when you're reading or writing or doing your math work, if it gets a little hard, should you give up? No. No. If we keep trying, we always get a reward. Maybe your reward is you finish the book or you finished your story, or you did all your math work, but we never give up. Tell me what that big word is again. Persevere. Persevere, and what does it mean? Never give up. You got it, nice job, go ahead. No. <laughs> So again, uh, Taryn Dawson. Taryn was actually tying this into a reading lesson. So you could see how the kids were engaged. And uh, again, the vocabulary, although it's well above uh, kindergarten level, it's a word that these kids all know and they all embody and embrace. So um, again, many thanks to Taryn Dawson, a superstar at Emerson Williams. Thank you. Any comments from anyone? Well, I'd just like to comment, and people out there in the audience who are administrators and teachers know, to be a great teacher, you have to be a great actor. And you could see there, I mean, she was really um, exaggerating her, mo her emotions and her um, body movement, and, and that's what a great teacher does. And at convocation, on behalf of the board, I spoke to the teachers, and I said that we are 110% behind them, and we are. And um, you could see why. They're very dedicated and hardworking people. So great. Okay. All set. All right. Next on tonight's agenda, then, is the approval of the minutes of the regular Board of Ed meeting on August 22nd, 2017. Are there any corrections? Okay. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? Move to accept. A second? Second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Okay. Those, John and, okay, and Elaine abstain. Those minutes are approved. Is there anyone wishing to make a public comment? Please come on up to the podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you that we have a five-minute limit. Hi, my name is uh, Carolyn Fazina. I live uh, Fairmont Street. Um, I'm also the director of the Keenan Kids After School Enrichment Program. So I just wanted to come and use my five minutes to uh, give a quick update uh, about the school year. Um, registration opened on August 30th. Um, just a couple notes about the registration before I go into specifics. Um, we always encourage families to register online. We had a, a um, quite a larger number of families using the online process, which was great. Um, this helps us know registration numbers faster um, so we can see where we're at. And also families know immediately if they got into a class or not as opposed to sending in a paper or delivering a paper um, registration to the um, office here. It is, um, we take both, so if you can't get on, they can't get on a computer to do it, but online is always preferred. Um, and also, just a, I'd like to ask um, for anybody watching or anybody that's interested in if there are families that are going to register their students for a program, the sooner they do it, the better. Uh, most of our programs have a minimum, and um, if we get close to the time that it's supposed to start and we don't reach the minimum, we have to cancel. So I know sometimes um, registrations come in late, quite late or last minute, which we do accept, but um, the earlier the better so we can know if something's going to run. Um, now on to the good stuff. 
Um, we, as of today, we have 649 enrollments, and we've been only open since the 30th, so it's just a couple weeks, I guess. Um, our programs this year include, or the, for the fall session, yoga. Um, most of our usual ones from last year, but we have some great new ones. So uh, yoga, cooking, uh, Star Wars cartooning, mad science, magic illusions, denim dreams, which is a fashion design class, um, airplane captains where kids will make their own airplanes and helicopters and fly them, take them home, uh, creative writing, computer coding, ukulele club, uh, Spanish for kids, set design, art, different art, various art classes, and a board game club. Um, we continue to have outstanding uh, instructors from outside um, vendors, our own district teachers. We are really thrilled to have our Spanish for Kids class is going to be taught by two Honor Society um, students from the high school. Um, we also have an instructors coming from the Microsoft store to teach computer coding this year. So we really, um, we, we think we're offering some great um, variety for everybody. Um, one other um, note is that we are partnering with the Y this year. We are offering the three schools for right now that have the Y program after school. Um, the Y is offering um, reduced pricing for care after our Keen on Kids program. So if uh, parents can't get to school at 4 or 425 when the program ends at their respective school, um, they can purchase um, care for just the bit of time afterwards um, from the Y. So um, that's a great partnership that we are um, happy to have started this year. And um, we're just excited for the new programs and to see all the kids come back and uh, learn something new and just enjoy uh, trying new things and socializing and all the fun stuff that comes along with it. So just wanted to give a quick little update and uh, uh -huh. thank you. So. Thank you, Caroline. Any questions for her? Holly? Uh, uh, yeah, when do the programs actually start? So um, we've had um, all, all the off, I, I'm, this gets confusing, but Keen on Kids programs start next week um, and then can start anytime between next week and the end of the session, which is the, uh, December. Um, we have running clubs through Parks and Rec that also um, are after school programs, and those begin this week. And also, um, at, we have um, afternoon athletes type classes that start this week. They, those two start a week earlier, but the rest start next week. Okay, um, good. So, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, you from much. all of us. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Anyone else for a comment? Okay, Mr. Emmett, do you have any communication tonight? I do, uh, thank you, Mrs. Granado. Good evening, everyone, uh, a few items this evening. I uh, just wanna let you know that the uh, fall sports season is underway, uh, games began last week. Uh, I've had the opportunity thus far to uh, see a girls soccer game, football last Friday, and uh, JV varsity girls volleyball games uh, last night. I um, was also awaiting the opportunity to see the cheerleaders, dance team, and marching band, but uh, we had a, a sizable downpour on Friday uh, that dashed those hopes. I certainly uh, do need to bring to the attention to the community uh, the issue of access to Catone Field um, during off hours. We're seeing an increasing number of uh, individuals hopping over the fence um, outside of school hours and even during school hours and school programs to access the fields. Um, it's important that permission for the use of Catone Field go through the Park and Rec Department and uh, we cannot have folks on the field um, either during programs or um, during off hours. Um, we're seeing that a lot. Actually on Friday, uh, we're getting ready for the football game. We had a group that hopped the fence and was over on the new softball field. So um, Weatherseal Police responded as well as our security team to let the folks know that that is uh, not appropriate. Um, with the recent uh, natural disasters in Texas and certainly in Florida, uh, it's brought out the best in our community. Um, we have multiple efforts across the district to support um, uh, students and families in need, both down in Texas as well as in Florida. This evening you'll hear a presentation from Mrs. DeSoli regarding the district assessment performance, um, and I will also be discussing the budget status, or lack thereof, uh, later on in the meeting. Last Thursday I attended the uh, Hartford Area Superintendents Association meeting. This was the first of the year. Uh, obviously the lack of a state budget was the primary topic and it was perfectly clear that many other districts um, are also grappling with the potential significant reductions. I also had the opportunity last week to meet with the members of the Wesfield Chamber of Commerce for the quarterly meeting. 
Uh, please remember that the Corn Fest takes place this coming Saturday. Our cheerleaders will be uh, performing as well as our Weathersfield High School marching band. And uh, finally, I do want to give a shout out to our band parents. Um, I, I learned on Friday the hard work that band parents do. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, just prior to their performance on Friday, we had a heavy downpour. As the <coughs> students rushed up from the field with their instruments, uh, a whole cadre of parents joined in to assist. I went in to visit the band room because I wanted to uh, see Mr. Bowles, who was absolutely soaked. And the room was absolutely bustling with parents helping to dry <coughs> instruments and hang uniforms. This type of support of our programs is deeply appreciated and uh, it serves as a foundation for the su uh, success of our band program. So parents of the Weathersfield High School Marching Band, thank you. With that, that's the conclusion that's of great. communications. Okay, <laughs> any comments on that? And um, Ellie, did you get that Diane Fitzpatrick is here? Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, there are no action items tonight on our agenda, so we're gonna move on to our reports and discussion. And the first one is on the 2016-2017 Student Achievement Presentation. Sally? Good evening. So I'm excited to be here with everybody. It's great to see lots of students in the audience tonight. Uh, so tonight we'll be presenting our annual overview of the 2016-2017 uh, student achievement results with a focus primarily on state or national standardized assessments. So here's an outline of what we're gonna look at tonight. We're gonna start with a smarter balanced assessment. Sometimes you'll hear me refer to that as the SBAC. Uh, the officials at the state refer to that as a smarter balanced assessment, but sometimes I use uh, the shortcut. Um, science CMT and CAPT, the SAT, the ACT, the UConn Early College Experience Courses, or commonly known as the ECE, along with advanced placement results or the AP exams. So for those of you that have heard my presentation over the years, um, sometimes it's been really long and sometimes it's a little bit shorter. I'm, I'm happy to tell you there's less slides this year. Um, but again, I wanna remind you as I do every year that when looking at district success, you need to consider multiple snapshots or my favorite analogy of a photo album of pictures. So tonight, while I'll be sharing many snapshots of student performance, these are really only a few snapshots of how we can truly measure success in our students in our district. Mr. Emmett already pointed out other success stories that we heard today. So this slide reminds you about other snapshots we should also consider when measuring success. If any of you watched the network broadcast on Friday in, night entitled the XQ Super Schools, any of you see that? It was on all the major networks. Um, you would have noticed that they didn't ask about smarter balanced assessment scores. They didn't ask about SAT scores. Instead, their message was really about motivating and igniting the passion of our students and connecting the educational process to the community as a whole. So again, please remember that while we value the results of these standardized assessments, they're only a small slice of the larger measure of school and district success. Weathersfield Public Schools want to educate well-rounded students, have them be an integral member of safe, productive, and encouraging school climates, and we want to surround our students with competent and empowered staff and community partners that make learning authentic. So with that said, let's move on to the Smarter Balanced Assessment results. Smarter Balanced Assessment is administered in grades three through eight um, last May. So just for quick background, the Smarter Balanced Assessment in Language Arts uh, is divided into four scores, or subscores, or claims. So it's broken down into reading, writing, listening, and the research or inquiry claim. In mathematics, uh, we have an overall score, but like in language arts, it's broken down into four areas, concepts and procedures, 
problem solving, communicating reasoning, and modeling and data analysis. So overall, scores on the Smarter Balance are reported in four different achievement levels. Uh, we will be focusing on students in levels three and four, as outlined in red on the screen. So this uh, slide provides an overview of all grades in both English and language art. So as a district, we continue to be extremely proud of the achievement scores in both language arts and math. Do we have work to do? Yes. But we also celebrate tonight the incredible work of our students, teachers, and administrators, staff, and the support from the parents in the community. While the state average growth was around 1.8%, Weathersfield demonstrated a two-year growth of 9.6% in English language arts on the Smarter Balanced Assessment when comparing the results from 2015 to through 2017. In the same time period for math, the state's average growth was 5.5%, and Weathersfield has more than doubled that at 13.5% growth over two years. So we have a lot to be proud about. So the next few slides will focus primarily on the English language arts results for the Smarter Balanced Assessment. So this slide shows the grade level comparisons, again, from 2015 to 2017. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had record increases. We had Governor Malloy uh, start the school year with us, along with the Commissioner of Education. So in 2017, we see cohort variances in performance, which is typical in any standardized score. Um, but all grades outperformed the 2015 baseline scores. And some grades even continue to demonstrate even, even greater growth. Grades four, seven, and eight continue to demonstrate even more growth. You can also see how all grades are performing above the state average. So the next six slides demonstrate grade level performance at each school, comparing 2015, or our baseline scores, in blue, 2016 in red, and 2017 in green. And you'll see the same kind of representation as we go through. So this uh, represents uh, grade three, and you'll see that we have a reflection upon the state, Weathersfield as a district, and the five schools. So one of the things we always want to look at is um, our performance in comparative to the state average. Well, you can't compare grade four results with grade five results because of the nature of this assessment. You would want to be able to compare our results to the state average. So grade four, grade five, grade six, and this PowerPoint is on our website. Um, for future reference. I know I'm going through a lot of information quickly. Grade seven. And grade eight. So now we're gonna move into math and look at some similar comparisons in mathematics. So like we saw in English language arts, all grades are all performing above the state average. All grades with the exception of one grade performed at a higher level in 20, 2017 than in 2015. Grades four and eight continue to maintain or demonstrate additional growth this year. Take a look at grade eight math. Grade eight math has almost doubled their performance scores. Uh, Sally, can I just interrupt for a minute sure. on this? Um, because as I tell everybody through the years, what I always did was if you look at grade six in 2014-15, they become grade seven in 2015-16, and then they become grade eight. And they, the improvement is what you're watching a group of children improve, not a new group coming in every year that a teacher gets scores on. Yeah, so um, in some tests that's true. When we look at some growth scores, we can look at that later when we have access to growth scores. One of the things we have to be careful with, though, is your third grade test is different than your fourth grade, which is different than your fifth. So uh, while we typically do see um, the numbers increase, what the state's um, analytical guide that's about 50 pages long, it's really light reading before you go to bed, um, will uh, caution you from comparing grade to grade. 
So it's like saying you can't compare the SAT with the ACT because they're two different tests. While there are some similarities between the grades, the uh, test specifications for third grade and fourth grade are different. Um, so we typically see that trend, but the um, statisticians will tell you not to make that comparison. But the hard part is um, that you have different students, right? For those three years, you will have cohort differences because you'll have different groups of students each year. Mm -hmm. So you really want to look at um, this over time. Again, that snapshot when you uh, go to the doctor and they take your blood test, uh, uh, blood pressure, or that you get on the scale, you want to look at how your weight trends over time, not the one day that you prepared for that annual physical and, you know, cleansed for the week before. Um, you want to be able to trend your data over time. Same thing with our student achievement scores. Okay. Okay. Would, I, would I read this chart then diagonally? 52% of grade six is the 60% of grade seven is the 66% of grade eight because that's the same cohort traveling through. Well, she's, it's so the same it is the same kids. cohort. It's a different test. It's yes, but it's a different it's test. Kids. Kids. Yeah. So the state will tell you that you can't expect students, the, the fifth grade scores aren't going to be, so let's say kids always performed the same. There was no other variations. You're not, you're not going to see a trend. If, uh, so let's look at the state average, right? If that was true, third grade would have the lowest scores and sixth grade would have the highest. If you look at our state average, that's not true. So there, the idea that um, if it was the same test and as they had more education, their scores would go up, it's always a different test and the cutoff scores for that test are done individually by a grade level. So you have to... Uh, um, Am I reading it correctly in the grade three, five, and seven in 2015? better than 2016 by a significant number. Give me that, say that again. What, start with one grade. 15, 16, grade three was a 63.6. And then in 16, 17, it went down to a 58. So we, we have the same kid, not the same kid, but the same test given, same type of test given. Correct. But it went down, and so did it do that in grade four? Five, almost went down 10 points. Correct. So if you look at grade three, so you will have what we call cohort differences. Um, within that grade, you're going to have different number of students in each year, different number of special education, um, English language learners. You're going to have a different profile of your cohort group. Um, yes. Yeah, so in third grade, the baseline year, we had 50% um, at level three or above. We grew up to, so we jumped up almost 14%, which is a huge jump compared to the state average I don't know off the top of my head, but would be in the single digits. And then we showed a decrease. So again, as we look at a student achievement data by looking at different cohorts, you're going to see a variation. As we have continued years, we'd see trends. Um, so another interesting one is to take a look at grade 7. So grade 7 started at 42%, had a huge growth up to 18%. There are not many uh, grade levels around the district, around the state, that grew 18% for 2016, it dropped down 3%. So while you could say it dropped 3%, the year before had outstanding increase, really what is unusual increase by 18%. What is significant, like um, grade seven, 60.3 went to 57, like you just said, 3%, is that? considered significant statistically? So what I would, so let's, is, it, is it a number as big as 18? So let's look at this next slide. That's a great question. So I always make those, what is significant? I take a look at the state average. So the state started, and this is a third grade math example, the state started at 48%. The state in the first year saw a 5% increase. So that's statewide. Doesn't mean that every district's gonna show a 5% increase. You'll see by this, some of our schools, Hamner, doubled their results in that year. They had a 34% increase. Um, if you look at the state average between the red and the green, the state in third grade showed no increase in their scores. They flatlined. We have some schools that went up and some schools that went down. We had that variance, but if the state average has kind of flatlined, that's a reference point when looking at our data. I, I guess what I'm asking, Sally, is that's the whole state. What I'm looking at is what's happening here in Weathersfield. 
And when I see Weathersfield second column there, you have a 50 as the state average, right? Or the weather, what's the 50 in the first column under Weathersfield? So that would be 2015, that would be the baseline data. 50. 50. And then 64. Yep, so we had a drop of um, six. Correct. Okay, is a drop of six considered significant when we have basically the same teachers, same materials, same, um, a lot of the same things still going on, not compared to the state, but what's going on between Hamner, <coughs> Hamner um, you know, the one grade to the next grade that comes in. Do you understand what I'm saying? Correct. Like, so like Hamner 68 in the red there, and, um, and then it dropped to eight points this year. Now they had the same set of teachers, different population went yep. there. Absolutely. So a 6% would be a reasonable uh, cohort difference. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, and there's no magic number as to what that what is. They, most people say statistics. Correct. Okay. And so what you'll find is some schools that have lower enrollment, their numbers are going to swing more because they have less the students. Sometimes uh, changes in populations with large enrollment, again, it's the law of percentages. Um, but I can assure you that teachers, administrators are really diving into this data about what can we learn from it uh, from our students. Um, and again, this is one snapshot in May. We have children that uh, we have warm weather, we have distractions, we have, you know, uh, we work incredibly hard to keep people on task. Um, but we also have uh, students have good days and bad days during testing. Um, just like when I always use doctor analogies, when I go to the doctor, sometimes I have good health and bad health, depending upon the month. So, so great questions. So uh, we continue with math to grade four, uh, to grade five, to grade six, grade seven, and grade eight. So, Sally, yep. the, the state does not use this data to track the progress of a given class. So, as Bobby mentioned, we don't look at where they are in grade three and track them through grade eight. I realize they're different tests, but they're, they're age and grade appropriate. Um, there must be some analysis that can be done with the data to show how those kids progress in yeah. English and math. Yeah. So uh, this happens to be proficiency scores, students that have hit certain bars of expectations as identified by the Smarter Balanced Assessment or the other assessments. Um, in student programs and services, we looked at those school and district um, performance matrices. They had number of students at proficiency, but they also had percent at growth. So the uh, state actually just today have released some data, and I didn't have time to go through it all because it came out today. So what they do to look at that growth is they look at the scale scores, not whether they've met the benchmarks, and looked at how many points they grow from year to year to identify student growth as a cohort. So yes, it's calculated differently. So we'll see that data. You will see that. I'll include that in um, one of your upcoming um, packets. I'll give it to Mr. Emmett. Just, just came. It's also on EdSite, um, which is a state data um, warehouse on the website. Can we get on without a password? Yep. Yep, because it's only school or uh, district. Same um, um, link I sent you before, Elaine. Okay. Yep. Um, and then when they publish that in the district and school um, performance, I don't remember the exact title, um, we will bring those back to student programs and services and kind of go through all the data again. So this chart shows you the rank order for Weathersfield when you rank order the 24 towns in Dirk D in respect to mathematics in language arts for the uh, Smarter Balanced Assessment scores. So for example, when you sort districts from the highest to the lowest, Weathersfield is ranked number nine out of 24 towns for mathematics and number 12 out of 24 towns for English language arts. Uh, for reference, this slide identifies those 24 comparative towns as the state identifies as District D, which are in some ways uh, social economically similar to Weathersfield based upon um, some calculations that have gotten on the old side, shall we say. But it's comparison of towns that we can look at. So we're going to move on to science. 
so one of the things to uh, remember is that science CMT and CAPT are not aligned with the new um, next generation science standards. Uh, the science CMT and CAPT uh, is, is reported in five different performance levels and we'll be looking primarily at level four and five in the red box. So this chart displays a three year trend for each school at or above goal. Uh, did I skip one? Um, and it also shows you uh, the the or above goal in blue, and also the or above proficient in red. This chart shows you the three year, I'm sorry, four year comparison. Um, the science assessments in both five and five, grade eight and grade ten were administered online for the very first time this year. Um, the state has not released um, state averages or press release with the science data, but based upon ag anecdotal conversations with the other districts, their science scores have also um, trended down. Um, we contribute that a lot to kind of a new test model online. So they took this test online? So Correct. Have yep. we given them any chance, the students, to do that in, before the test? Um, so for our elementary students, it's similar software um, that the language arts and maths, um, but they've taken a test that was designed for paper and pencil and put it on a computer program, right? It wasn't designed for a computer software program. Um, at our at 10th grade, those students have not been taking the SBAC for the last two years and had less, very little familiarity or less familiarity with the online software platform. It was also the very last year for the science capped. Um, and, and I think it's you know impacted some of our results. I think technology impacted the results last year, and that what we're seeing is a, a slight leveling off. Um, yeah. Because I think the kids got very techy savvy with those tests a year ago, um, and we're seeing it continue. And, and I think there's also that discussion of how much is this assessment measuring uh, tech skills, and right. how much is it measuring mathematics and language arts. Um, uh, keyboarding, while well, we instruct and we looked at keyboarding and looked at a relationship between how students performed on the assessment and keyboarding skills, there's definitely kind of a trend line related to that. Um, while we work on that, you know, students have different skills. Um, math also had some very, um, while we practice and expose students, ways of developing graphs and manipulating things that are specific to this testing software. So we definitely have things in place about practice tests and exposing them to the software. Um, but there's that learning experience with specific tools for any software. So here is the uh, four-year trend for eighth grade science. And again, the state has not released its average. Um, middle school had a, a nice increase for seventh grade, uh, for eighth grade science. Here is the tenth grade. Um, again, the last year of the science capped. 38% um, at or above goal and 83% proficient. Um, next year, we anticipate piloting. Um, we had a small number of people piloting the next generation science assessment this year. We expect uh, having more pilots for the next generation science test, and also um, the science will move to 11th grade. Uh, we'll have a year off from science results and then have a year of the next generation science assessment the following year. So let's move into uh, SAT. So last March was the second year that the SAT was administered statewide. It was replaced, um, it replaced the Smarter Balanced for 11th grade. It's a high school state standardized assessment for English language arts and math. Over 72% of the junior class last year met or exceeded the Connecticut benchmarks. And again, Connecticut has different benchmarks than the College Board. These are the Connecticut benchmarks. Um, and these are the results for evidence-based reading and writing. And again, we're also above the state average. In mathematics, Weathersfield also scored well above the state average with almost 44% of the junior class meeting or exceeding the Connecticut benchmarks.
The ACT is another standardized measure used by some colleges and universities that students opt to take outside of the school day. Only 54 students opted to take the ACT this year. How many was that? 54. Can you tell, just quickly, I know it's a lot, but could you tell the difference between SAT and ACT? I always thought ACT was more curriculum based. Yes? Off the top of my head, I can't give you all the nitty okay. gritties. Um, and that's okay, because I know it's a lot, but I was always told one was SATs was more an aptitude test. And so the SATs ACT. also has subject-based scores now, so you can take some subject-based, correct? Subject-based uh, science, okay. and okay. Oh. they have subject-based courses you can take for SAT also, which would be like the ACT. Um, they also have a writing portion that's not on our state SAT example. Um, so if you know which college you're going to, there are some colleges that are looking for both or one or the other. SAT is a primary one. Um, uh, but you're right, in this case, there okay. it's broken down also for a science score on the ACT. So we're gonna move into what we call the ECE or the Yukon Early College Experience Courses. Uh, this is an opportunity for students to take first year Yukon curriculum or courses uh, work while at high school. All teachers that teach these courses meet certain criteria and serve as adjunct Yukon faculty. The next two slides show the number of students who have taken the course and the percent of students who have earned a B or better. AP or advanced placement courses follow curriculum that is also equivalent to a first year college course. We strive to continue to promote both AP and ECE courses and encouraging students to take at least one of these courses while in high school in a supportive environment. As you can see, even though we offered more options through UConn starting in 2013, which has a little asterisk, our student participation in AP exams remains strong. 151 different high school students took an AP exam last year. And again, this is in addition to the uh, ETH. It could be some of the same students or different students as we look at the uh, Yukon courses. Last year, 210 AP exams were administered at Wethersfield High School, and 64% scored a three or higher on the AP exam. So we continue to increase our numbers, which is our primary goal, while remaining uh, at a strong passing rate. But our goal is really to expose more students to a first year college-like course, so they're prepared um, when they move off to college to understand that difference in type of curriculum and coursework. Um, Janet, the can we go yeah. back to that 48 number of uh, students taking the AP exam? Uh, which one? This slide? Uh, no, the one that's got the, yes, that one. That one, yep. Um, ours shows 2014, 151 students. It shows the reverse. Uh, so so uh, the, the, the two, 2014 is on the top, 2017 is on the bottom. Right, and then it says instead of 99 for, fi for yeah, 2014, sure. it says 151. And then for 2015, it says 142, where it's 2016. So it's re it's dropping versus going upward in that screen that you that yeah. we got. Is it the most recent version? Yeah, I didn't change this slide. Uh, so the numbers, the numbers, uh, that's a mystery. 2014, it says 99 up there, but here it says 151. I will take a look at that. I must have transposed something. Yeah, um, so I think the chart, I think this chart is accurate. I might have, as I was working with these numbers, maybe transposed it. Okay, so I'll this, take a look at that, but thank okay. you. Just want to make sure. We, um, After a while, I started looking crooked. Can, can, we get the, can we get the breakdown of the kid of the scores for and above? Those are the scores that the colleges take, is the fours and the fives. Yeah, I can get you uh, in the packet more information on the, S, uh, the AP. Sure. Um, and here are the number of exams taken each year in the different areas. As we're looking at the Sally, too, is there criteria for getting into an AP class? I think we had discussed that during student program and services. 
No, there I mean, is there, none. there okay. are some recommendations. Um, in some courses, there are course prerequisites you have to have. Uh, there are definitely some recommendations. Um, it is our belief of not uh, limiting AP enrollment to only students that have a 90% chance of getting a four or greater. Our belief is that we want students to be exposed to challenging college-like courses while in an environment that they have supportive teachers at Weathersfield High School. Um, your student to teacher ratio is not one to 300 like as a college, that they can learn uh, how to best learn in this type of first year college course when the ratio is maybe one to 20 or one to 23. Um, so we tend to capture a wider net around encouraging students to take um, AP or ECE courses. Obviously, we want our students to be very successful and give them the tools, but we do not limit it to students that are 90% likely to get a four or a five. Mm -hmm. On this one, Sally, I, need, I would like the information that says how many students were in microeconomics in, the, in 2017 before only four took, Oops. Only four took the exam. How many were in the class? Yep, so you want me to get you the enrollment report? Yeah, uh, that would be helpful to, to see, um, you know, the statistics class is very important to me. Right, so and one of the things to consider about the AP exams is they are not required. Students right. have to pay for the exams. Right. Right. Um, parents will make choices right. of whether they take the UConn exam or the AP or both or choose not to take the exam because some of our seniors know which college they're being accepted to. The college may not give them credit, therefore they decide. So there are probably, we talked about this as student programs and services, probably 25 different variables that go into the decision making process of whether they take the exam or not. Um, and because the district does not pay for the cost of it, it's up to the student and the family. Diane, would you say, Diane DeVito, would you say how many people were in that Spanish language culture class and none took the test? I can get that data. That was last June. You're expecting her to remember back in last June. I'll get you the enrollment data. I'll get you the, I'll send the enrollment data. In 16, there was a number of kids in that class. There were 16 in that class? No, in 2016, there was a number, we spoke about this at programs and services. I think there was like between 18 and 20 kids in that class. And I'm looking for the number for 2017. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's paying a class and nobody's taking the exam it's kind of like yeah. there's also some AP exams that are incredibly difficult AP biology is one of the most difficult AP courses to take um, <laughs> sometimes AP psych um, might be considered and again it depends upon your learner and your student a course that might be uh, open to more students that, so there are levels of difficulty of how many students take the, the test nationally in performance level? But I'll send all that AP information to okay. along with the enrollment. So these last two slides, I actually I added after uh, you got this on Friday. Um, so uh, know that they're not in your packet. But I uh, I've added these two slides to display some of our trending demographic data. This slide demonstrates the 10-year trend for the number of students receiving free or reduced meals in red, so the top line. Uh, in 2008, we had 474 students receiving free or reduced meals. We now have 639 students. The number of students receiving special education in green has gone from 377 to 493. And the number of English language learners in our district in purple, which has grown from 185 to 280. Well, the number of students qualifying for free reduced meals, special education services, and English language services has increased substantially. Our test scores have also, also continued to improve. So this year, we will educate over 280 students that speak one or more of 34 different languages. It's really amazing. So this month, as we have new students that have entered Weathersfield Public Schools, we are screening 140 new possible English language learning students, which is almost half, well, which is half of our current enrollment. So this slide is meant to demonstrate that we have changing demographics in Weathersfield but our test scores are increasing. 
So another piece of data I want to share with you is um, that we have a more mobile population in Wethersfield. So we, I, what I did is I took a look at the current fifth grade cohort. And I found, and I actually kind of was quizzing people in the office, and I said, what percent of our current fifth grade do you think didn't go to kindergarten in the same school? And I got answers all over. And so we found that 30% of our district fifth graders did not attend the same elementary school for kindergarten. In Emerson Williams, 40% of their current enrollment has not been uh, in Emerson Williams since kindergarten. So these 30% of our students have not been immersed in the Wethersfield curriculum and related services since kindergarten. Based upon the new reg student registrations that Mr. Emmett signs, he can attest to the continuous number of new students that enroll in our schools throughout the entire year and all grades. Last year, excluding new kindergarten students, so only looking at grades one through 12, we had 193 new students enter the district. So again, this slide reminds us that our population is more mobile than it was in the past. This is really a testament to our staff then, that we're taking kids who are new to our system and kids who we would think would be operating under some limitations, socially or culturally, and they're doing even better. Correct, so they have not been too are exposed in our services. Um, so if you look at the student, percent of students at or above goal, you look at the number of students um, in our different subgroups and the number of students that have not been exposed to our, pop, our curriculum, our test scores are phenomenal. So I wanna end this presentation with, for my appreciation for the parents, especially those of you watching and are here in the audience tonight. Our students, that's you guys out there, our teachers and our staff at Wethersfield Public Schools, including the administrative team sitting in the audience today. They have all engaged in this extremely hard and important work that influences student learning. They have worked collaboratively as stakeholder teams to develop, implement, and refine goals related to the three district areas of importance, academic, civic, and problem solving. Every day, they work hard to ensure that students are safe, supported, receiving high quality individualized instruction and supports. So Nelson Mandela once said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. I firmly believe that our administrators, teachers and support staff are focused on educating the next generation who will change the world. Many who will be employed in careers that don't even exist today. They are also working incredibly hard to ensure students to ensure that students discover their passions, develop grit, ignite their inner creativity, learn how to be innovative thinkers, demonstrate empathy for others, and learn to love and accept others for who they are. Just to name a few of the important attributes that aren't measured in the achievement data shared tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Sally. Any questions from anyone? anyone? Comments, John? Um, thank you, Sally. Uh, I'm sure you're still wondering what you just said. <laughs> it's, not, it's a lot to uh, go through. But um, I think it, hopefully it was done in a way that we all could see. And you're going to put this on the website? Once? Correct. It should be on the website already. OK. And if you could just check that slide. That, I will. Uh, I'll check the APA. I might have switched them around. That's OK. And then I have a, um, in your comparison, um, of the DRGs. Uh, in math, we were number nine. In English language, uh, we were 12 for 2017. And we've done the 2015, 2016. Is there any way that we can get that information to find out how we improved or stayed the same or went down? Yeah, that's a great question. And I knew that question was coming tonight. So the state in the past has provided us a lot of that information in Excel document. Um, and I shared with Mr. Emmett, I think the state is feeling the effects of the budget reductions. You know, we don't have average data for um, science. Uh, I mentioned they sent out some data today. They didn't send us it in a spreadsheet way we could use it. They sent it, they put it on the website. There was no press release. There was no analysis. There was nothing that they normally give us. Um, they did not give us school level data to be able to kind of do that comparison um, with all the grades and some we've given you more of that data in the past. 
um, they provide us a spreadsheet where we could break that down and I love to, to go through that data. They didn't provide that to us in a way that we could look at. Um, I will tell you that I remember the years standing up here and we were 23rd in our DERG and 24th in our DERG. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I'm proud of the incredible growth. And when you look at the numbers, there are a lot of schools really close to us. It's not like they're, you know, the, the numbers could be like a 1% different, right? Which is very small as we look at that data. So that's really exciting to see. Um, so please know I tried looking for that data, but it wasn't provided to us like it had been in the past because I think, I believe, because of budget cuts. And I'm glad you brought it to the table regarding the information that you used to report on. You know, we're 23 out of 40 or, you know, yeah. it just wasn't, you know, where we are. So I think that in itself uh, has shown our growth in yeah. uh, what we're doing with, with our uh, district. Thank you. A lot to be proud of. Janet? A uh, quick question. Do we have a total um, of students registered within the pub Weathersfield Public Schools? Uh, the total enrollment? Yes, please. Um, we do. I don't bring it with me. October 1st, you'll have the enrollment report with the October 1st data. October 1st becomes important because that's when data report for the state. So right. after that, the re enrollment report. Do you want me to email you the re enrollment as of today? Uh, no, we will talk to over in a couple weeks. Okay, Thank that's you. fine. Okay. Anyone else with comments? Um, thank you, Sally. And as all the teachers know, too, the data that we get on a student is what's so valuable moving forward. You use the analogy of a medical report. Mm -hmm. It really is an individual report. The numbers look great, but this is groups of children. Correct. Um, I like it when teachers utilize those test scores to improve a child's. Yep, thinking. and they're, they're busy looking at those. Yep. Thank you very much. One more thing to note, uh, the state has not yet sent us um, the parent reports. They were anticipated the middle of September um, into the district, and then it takes us uh, uh, about a week to get them out to all students three through eight plus 10. Um, we anticipate those coming in. Sometimes things from the state are not timely, um, but I will get them out as soon as they come in. So uh, please be patient. And can, okay. can you make sure we get the uh, school reports by grade? We never got those this year. Um, so tell me more. What else would you I like, Elaine? Go to Ed's site, and I put in your password. Mike gave us, and that would come every school and their grades. You know what they did in three, four, five, six. So that's what's uh, in the graphs. No, it hasn't. It hasn't been shown on Ed's site yet. Oh, correct on Ed's site. So uh, the so school level data is here. That's showing me everybody. That's not showing me by grade. No. So like this is math. For the state, Weathersfield and Emerson yeah, but, yeah, in just third, for, uh, fourth grade. So you're correct. They're they're behind, and I don't. Um, they didn't release this uh, again. This is some of the data um, I had to find in a password protected set of student level data on it. Um, but we used to be able to get on the last week of August and see it. I don't know if Ed's site will be. I would assume they're going to be putting this up there. Yeah. Yeah, science is not, not on their state they're again. Not they're not open yet unless we get a password from Mike. And Mike's always given us the password. No, there's not a password. No, there no, wouldn't be a password. A so the Ed site is where it would be. Um, but they, again, I think they're feeling some of these effects and it's taken a while. Of, yeah. It's, yeah. Lack of facility. Yep. Absolutely. Just yeah. to be patient. Yeah, well, I just wanted to remind you if you get it. I, you know, yeah, I'll, um, we'll put it in the packet if um, we get notification. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, our next report and discussion is on the 2017-2018 operating budget. Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mrs. Granato. Um, in terms of our operating budget for 2017-2018, we are in uh, very good shape at this point in time. Um, the reality here um, that we've talked about already, I'll mention again tonight, um, we continue to uh, be at an impasse at the state level and there is no state budget. Um, so the reality here is that we certainly need to plan for the event that the governor's executive order um, does go into effect on um, October 1st. Um, with that, um, the governor's executive order spoke to the tune of uh, $9.3 million in elimination of ECS funds. 
Um, as you may be aware, the governor came out with adjusted numbers on uh, Friday that also encompassed the state teachers retirement uh, fund contribution. Uh, Mr. Kazaka did an analysis and when all is said and done with municipal um, reductions and ECS restoration, um, we're looking at losing about $107,000. Um, at this point this afternoon, it was reported that the uh, Democrats and Republicans continue to be in an impasse. The Republicans have uh, released another version of the budget. I have not seen the specifics to that. With that being said, and looking at the uh, reduction or the elimination of $9.3 million, um, it's important to note that's just slightly less than 16% of our operating budget. Um, in terms of looking at reductions, areas that we would have to look at really run the gamut. Uh, from staff, uh, classroom teachers, support staff, extracurricular activities, sports, all of the things that we hold near and dear to our hearts. Um, I want to be clear with everybody that our focus was getting the school year started and getting the school year open successfully. We have done that. We continue to have funds to carry out this budget uh, for fiscal 2017-2018. Um, we've had conversations with the folks on the town side and from a um, cash flow perspective, we're looking to be okay um, from late November through mid-December. The piece with the ECS, let me explain that. The educational cost sharing funds do not come to the Board of Education, they come to the town. They're given out um, in three allotments. Um, the first allotment is due to come out in October, 25%. An additional 25% of that funding will come to the town in January, and the final 50% comes to the town in April. So we have a budget that has been approved. It's a budget that you've worked on, that I've worked on, that the town council has worked on, so that is in place. Um, we do need to be well aware of the fact that we have the potential of, of reductions here. We're certainly hopeful that we get a budget. I know I've spoken with parents of the WSPC and they are getting the word out. We certainly need to reach out to our elected officials uh, to, again, focus them on making sure that they're getting to the table and they're getting a budget done. This is something that is not exclusive to Weathersfield whatsoever. As I mentioned before in my communication section, all kinds of towns are going through this. Even those towns that are alliance districts that continue to have their funding, while they've maintained their alliance district funding, they've lost in other areas through their municipal budget. So this is an impact on everyone. And I want to be clear with all parents and all members of the community that as your superintendent, I intend to continue to maintain high quality programming for our students. They deserve it, and it's our responsibility to provide it. So I am hopeful that um, by the next Board of Education meeting, we have a budget in place, and we can continue to move forward. Again, at this point in time, we're operating business as usual. However, I will tell you, as I've mentioned before, um, knowing that we had this significant potential ECS cut, I have frozen the budget at this point in time. So we're looking to maintain uh, our funds in an effort to deal with potential reductions. What does that budget freeze include? Well, obviously, it's going to include the, the basics um, in schools. What we did is on July 1st opened up the budget for the new fiscal year. So we've been able to take care of all of the materials and supplies that schools need to get us started. Um, one of the other things we've done is we've held positions in abeyance. So for example, um, in our administrative ranks, we are kind of thin at this point in time. We lost uh, one administrative position. Uh, that was done through attrition to get us to our current operating budget. We had another um, administrator that left during the course of the summer. We've posted the position at this point in time, but we have held off on doing any interviews or filling that particular position, given the uncertainty of the budget. So I will certainly um, work to keep everybody posted in terms of where we're at at this point in time. Again, our focus is on making sure our kids get everything they need to succeed. So with that, I'll entertain any questions. John? Yeah. Um, you know, there's no answer, but I just had a question, and I know maybe someone has talked about it. Um, every community uh, in the state has been uh, pushed upon with many unfunded mandates uh, that we continually move forward with. Have we looked at those mandates that are, that are unfunded to see um, are they essential? Are they things that we, what would happen if a community wasn't given their funding 
and you did not do a program that the funds aren't there any longer. What yeah. would happen to us? What could happen? Well, that's, that's a good question. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, one of the things that's a legislative mandate is the um, training, annual training of um, staff regarding restraint and seclusion. Every single year we have to provide restraint and seclusion training to all of our staff. There's a tremendous cost impact to that. Why? Because I've got to get subs to have the teachers come out and get the training. So one of the things we had um, scheduled in October was CPI training. And right now at this point in time, I've canceled it. I mean, it's, it's at that point where it's on the chopping block because we don't know if we're going to have the funding at this point. So the reality there is that's a potential liability. Let me mention another one. Uh, the legislature just enacted an issue related to students facing expulsion. Um, typically, when we move to expel a student, and it's not often, knock on wood, that we have to do that, I'm required to provide an alternate program for them. Typically, here in Weathersfield, that alternate program is um, 10 hours a week of tutoring. With new legislation that was enacted in July, I now have to provide a student who was expelled the same number of instructional hours as I would a typical student. That is extraordinarily costly. I've had multiple conversations with other area superintendents and we're all kind of shaking our heads saying, how do we pay for that? Ultimately, that ends up being most likely an outplacement. And again, you've got a tuition involved there. So there are a variety of different mandates that we have. Those are just a couple of actually recent examples. So it's, it's going to be difficult, John, to you know, try and answer your question. I don't know that I'm going to be able to meet all of the mandates if I'm not adequately funded. Now, at your, uh, is it the CAS meeting, superintendent's meeting? HASA meeting, yes. HASA meetings. Um, has, can you discuss that with them so that if there's like a, a uniformity of uh, school districts and superintendents so that, you know, you all have some kind of uh, a leader or a position that, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to fund this, but yet because we want to and fund instruction. You know what I'm saying? There's just yes. so many priorities that we have to deal with. So, I, you know, I would hope that something like that would be on your agenda with your group of superintendents to discuss. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up because it was one of the things with our uh, superintendents back to school meeting. Um, you may have seen it um, on the news. Superintendents um, came together at our annual back to school meeting with the commissioner and um, created a letter that went to legislators um, with a call to action to come to the table to collaborate and to get a budget done. And, you know, we've been adamant about, you know, being really caught in the middle. How do you move forward with programs? How do you move forward with instruction? You know, again, you look for innovation. I watched that, um, that video, the, 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 Q, the XQ video, and I was enthralled with some of the innovation. And I'm sitting there watching it, and I'm saying, well, how can I do this? How, how can I fund this? How can we be innovative? And I'm worried about being able to meet the, the basic auspices of what we provide. And again, when you look at having to make a reduction, a significant reduction, you're talking about cutting back down to core programs. Think about it. And I remember, I'll give you an example. 1952, um, we had a group of uh, young students over at the Stillman School. Um, they graduated and they've moved to California. A couple of years ago, they came back and they wanted to see the Stillman School. And would I please, you know, give them a tour? So in they came. And it was interesting because they showed me where everything was. And the one thing that they didn't have in that Stillman school, they didn't have a cafeteria because everybody went home. Everybody went home. They came in with breakfast. They went home for lunch. They came back. Schools nowadays, with all of the, the social demands, the emotional needs of students, we provide so much more than just basic education. What I saw at uh, the football game on Friday night, I saw, you know, I saw girls' sports. Didn't used to have that. Now we have girls' sports. You have, you, you have equality. We need to continue that. The, the basic tenet here is we have an obligation to provide education to our students. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon our state elected officials to make, make this happen and to get this budget done. You know, it's interesting when we see yet another company leaving Connecticut and moving the headquarters to Boston. How do we maintain the level of excellence in this state? We've got to do something. Something has to change. And again, from our standpoint here, I get it from the taxpayer point as well. I understand. 
I understand what you're dealing with with regard to taxes, and that's one of the reasons why this board, and I will say it very clearly and publicly, over the past two years, this board has come in with responsible budgets. We've had a, an increase of less than 2% over the past two years, average. So we understand, and again, we'll certainly come to the table with the town because we know this is going to impact the town as well. I know residents, you know, talking with residents on Friday, still haven't seen your car tax bills. So, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here in town. And again, for me, my goal is to make sure when those kids come into school, as you saw at the beginning and staff student recognition, those kids aren't worried about the budget. Those kids are being taken care of by a great teacher. So. Anyone else? Diane? Have we, uh, we spoke about this before, but have we formally notified all the, the groups and stuff, the teachers, advisors and stuff, that we are probably not going to be able to fund these trips like DECA and some of the other jets and stuff like that? Have we notified them that that's probably not going to yep. be able to occur this year? Yes. Also, I guess I would speak to to the the citizens of our town and the parents, you know, I, um, being around town over the past couple of months after, you know, these no budget and the budget cuts and the impact of the $9.3 million, I have not felt a sense of urgency, which is missing. Um, I don't think people in this town appreciate what that cut will do to our education system. I mean, I've seen it in other towns. They had protests. They, you know, called their legislators on the carpet, really put pressure on it, and and that concerns me because even if something happens this week and a budget is kind of mulled together, it, we might dodge that bullet, but we're not going to dodge the bullet next year because the the risk of us not having a budget adopted, the same situation happening next year is very probable and probably very high given that it's an election year, a gubernatorial and a House and Senate. So there's going to be no compromise next year. But you know, our citizens have to, I mean, there's got to be some outrage, there's got to be some pressure on it. I mean, our town's paying more attention to the turkey on Spring Street than it is to the educational situation in this town. And um, you know, it's very concerning. I'm, you know, I, because I still have a kid in the school, you know, I'm in areas where I, you know, I bring it up and stuff and people look at me like I have two heads, like, what are you worried about? People have to be worried about and have to start taking action because this is, you know, everybody's going to be here when screaming and yelling at us when we have to cut freshman sports and we have to eliminate this and have to eliminate that. But they got to understand that they got to get to Hartford and they got to put that pressure on there because you know our hands are tied. So I hope everyone heeds that warning and starts showing some outrage, not at us, but at, up in Hartford. Thanks, Di. Anyone else for a comment on the budget? John? Well, I think it's gonna happen uh, when October 1st comes. You're gonna see programs Hopefully. and s situations occur that we are gonna be forced to do that are gonna be beyond our control. <laughs> Um, so I think that's, you know, got to be an understanding that, you know, with the administrative team and the faculty and the board, decisions are going to be made regarding uh, some drastic measures that are going to occur not only in Weathersfield but within the state. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we may be a little bit better than some other communities, but we're not as good. So you're going to see a, a chain reaction occur. So. I think everyone's got to be on the same page, meaning school districts all have to work together uh, and stay within the same uh, element. So. Thanks, John. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll move on. We'll get back to all this, too. Move on to meetings held. Mr. Emmett, the School Project Building Committee. Yes, I attended the uh, building committee meeting uh, last evening. I'm very pleased to report um, that the building committee approved the final uh, batch of technology um, with regard to our Chromebooks, with regard uh, also to the project. So at this point in time on Monday, 
Um, this item will go before town council for final approval so that Mr. Raffanello can make that uh, final purchase. That will, um, with what we have already purchased within the project and what we have uh, added in recent years in our um, operating budget, will now put Wethersfield High School at one-to-one -one with regards to technology. So very, very excited about that and very appreciative of the work of the building committee to, to see this through. Um, this um, purchase is coming about, this was budgeted, uh, and at one point in time during the project, um, we had taken money out of the technology budget to cover other expenses. So we've saved additional funds, and as such, we'll be able to make this technology purchase with council approval. Okay, and the uh, WEC, the Wethersfield Early Childhood Collaborative, met on September 11th, um, Monday, at the library. WEC works with all our Wethersfield children from birth to eight to ensure healthy, developmentally successful learners and that these learners are then connected to the community and how important for a school system to have such a great foundation. The committee discussed the Summer K program and the soon to start the Vernon Regional Adult Basic Education, which is gonna be establishing a family learning program. Uh, further discussion was centered on the annual meeting and the program, which is scheduled for October 23rd at the Community Center from 5.30 to 7.30, and there will be more information to follow on this very important event. Okay, and then meetings held. you have another school projects building committee? Yeah, that actually, yeah. I reported on uh, last night's, the uh, previous meeting, actually uh, reporting uh, on behalf of Mr. Bushy. Um, the meeting two weeks ago, um, Mr. Bushy will be ordering our final uh, batch of uh, furniture as well. So that was approved by the building committee and that's actually been ordered. Good, okay. Um, finance committee meeting um, is coming up on 926? 926. 926, yeah. Okay. Um, is there any unfinished business on the board? Okay, anyone wishing to make a public comment, please come on up and state your name and address, and may I remind you that we have a five minute limit. No one? Okay, are there any board comments? Elaine? Um, Mr. Emmett, this yes. is no way um, reflective of any, any um, data that I have, um, except that I'm door knocking. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I'm in the High Crest area, and that grade four is um, from they, what they tell me, and it could be totally wrong, as I said. Um, they're at 26. Is that something you can verify for us, or do you, you just want to send it Friday? I'll be happy to send it on okay. Friday. Um, I've been I've as. I've been asked to yeah. go into doors. And, you know, yeah, what and I mean. Do? And I said, yep. I, I bring it to his attention, but until the money is released, we can do nothing. I, that's the answer I give, Mike. I hope that's accurate that's, for you. <laughs> that's very accurate at this point in time. And again, you know, we're adamant about trying to maintain low class sizes. And um, the reality is, even where we made the, the change at Charles Wright, that change came not with the addition of a staff member, but actually right. I mean, the, the reduction of a section mm -hmm. um, so at this point in time I know um, grade four at Highcrest we've seen an additional uh, off the top of my head approximately between 36 and 40 students mm -hmm. come into Highcrest um, wow. two years ago the the bump was over at Charles Wright right. so um, you know continuing continuing to monitor that you know again at this point in time we can't make any um, no, any, not till any October moves. 1st. But, and the class size has, has been the case um, over the course of the entire summer we'll have those numbers updated for you in uh, on Friday, and then the enrollment report, Janet, you talked about the enrollment report. Um, each year on a yearly basis, we do the enrollment report um, for PSIS reporting to the state, so that'll be coming in an uh, upcoming packet as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Sure. Janet, um, I don't recall what month it was, but the Community Public Relations Subcommittee, we had met at um, Wethersfield High School, and we had spoken with Mrs. Coco and a group of the kids, we had gotten a tour of the two rooms that we talked oh, yeah. about. Did we ever do that move? Mm -hmm. We're actually in the process of doing that right now. Okay. Keith is working on the networking piece. Okay, he great. expects to have it done within the month. Uh, Miss Coco um, was elated to say the least, okay, as good. was uh, Amina and uh, Jared, our two uh, anchors. Thank you. Sure. Yep. And Janet, on that, we did get to use the TV station, John Cassio and I, um, to get our strategic plan out. That's more to come on that. Okay. Oh, I okay. can't wait. <laughs> I have not asked to wait. I know. Uh. Red carpet. Any other comments, Polly? 
Uh, yes, I just um, there. I just had two things. Um, first of all, I was very excited to go to the um, football game on Friday, um, but I think we need to do better over the weather because um, it was all great, and then all of a sudden we had this deluge. And one of I was not only hoping to see um, our students, but or our football team play, but also was looking forward to the halftime show, and unfortunately, um, I bailed about two minutes before that. But I just wanted to point out they that- didn't perform. They didn't perform. No. All right, okay, I feel You'll a little better. performing queen, Okay, you have time. <laughs> okay, phew, all right. But I did want to mention that, um, it, it has been mentioned that we have a, there's a corn fest on uh, Saturday, and um, our cheerleaders, our marching band, and also our dance team will be performing at the Corn Fest. So um, you'll get an opportunity to, um, to see them. And um, also the Hunger Action Team will be um, sponsoring a food drive. So um, if you are able to get to the Corn Fest, which is always a great event, uh, be sure to bring some, uh, some food and right at the entrances they will, uh, they'll be collecting them. And then my second thing was, um, it, it, we received our first uh, update on Friday since school started. And as great as it is to get the, um, the summer uh, updates, I always love to see the ones when uh, school has started. Mm -hmm. And I would like to really thank the principals for, the, um, for these uh, great updates that we get. I love the pictures. and. Um, and they're just, they're terrific. And it's a nice thing um, on, a, on a Friday to, um, to see some of the wonderful things that we're doing in the schools that maybe those of us who don't have kids in the schools might miss. So thank you very much for that. Yes, I'd like to piggyback on that. I enjoy it very much reading about what's going on in the schools. So thank you. Anyone else for comments, John? Um, Holly, if you stayed, it was only rain. <laughs> they did perform. The dance the team dance. did dance, and the cheerleaders did perform at halftime. So well, you missed it. You have to go. Well, say, Safeguard's selling umbrellas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Foldable golf umbrellas, $25. Uh, <laughs> uh, have you needed them? I have them in my trunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, where were they Friday night? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Anyways, no, they did, and they did, a, you know, as red as they were, they, they were troopers out there, so they did, a, those kids uh, did a great job. Congratulations to them. Um, the other thing I uh, was asked to mention is that the class of 1967 is going to be holding their 50th class reunion in the community, and, uh, you know, a lot of great things happen in that class, and uh, they're looking for anyone that would like to give a donation. Uh, they have a raffle prizes, but I believe that their prizes, uh, they uh, con are contributing to various organizations. Very so nice. if you're interested, uh, you can reach me. I didn't graduate in 1967. <laughs> 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 <You're quite sure>. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm uh, like their messenger at this point. <laughs> <laughs> or 1952. <laughs> I wasn't even born. <laughs> okay, anyone else for comments at the end? All right, I'd just like to make a comment that, as Mr. Emmett said, we're making a very conscious effort to be prepared for whatever the state finally decides to do, um, but we are not going to be um, speaking doom and gloom. Um, this is a vibrant, alive school system. We have children who are very little up to children who are working very hard to move to their next step, and we are not going to discourage them. Um, I spoke at, on behalf of the board at the beginning of the school year at the convocation and I made a point to say that this board is 110% behind the teachers and the principals and the parents and those students out there. So I um, want to say it again. Um, we're working very hard. Um, we have this big roadblock ahead of us. I haven't heard very much from the public either, Diane, um, but I'm hoping that's because they have a lot of confidence maybe in us, or maybe in that a solution will happen. Okay? All right, so Justin, for your inauguration here, <laughs> can you have a few words about life at the high school? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Granato. Um, I believe that we had a very productive start to the school year. I attended, I attended the freshman orientation, which was the day before school started, and I think it was 
very beneficial and very helpful to the freshmen. They seem to enjoy it. Um, open house was last Wednesday night, so a lot of parents came. Um, a lot of pictures up around the school on the digital bulletin boards. Sports information night was last, last Tuesday for parents as well. We unfortunately lost our first football game to Middletown. Um, however, the cheer team, dance team, and marching band all performed in the pouring rain. Not marching band. <laughs> Not marching band? Yeah, sorry. Excuse me. Um, student council has started planning their fall activities, including the pep rally, powder puff, and homecoming. And they're also, they have also, I don't know if it's student council or another group of students, but they're organizing a talent show to, to benefit victims of the hurricane. So. I'll get a date for that and let you guys know. Um, as well, Blue Eagle News, that is online. I think it's on YouTube somewhere, so I'll have to find the YouTube channel for that and let you guys know. But I think that's it. Good. Thumbs it up. For the well, talent show. Thank you. You did a great job. Great start. Thank Polly you. Polly and you. Polly and you. Thank you. Well, I think Bobby and we should do something oh no! <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Any other comments tonight? <laughs> All right. May I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you and good night.